We deserve queer spaces because we deserve a place that is completely for us, where we can be completely free and fully accepted. A place where we are free to express whoever we want to be at any given moment, where we can dance, laugh, cry, and sleep without judgment because we're different than the cis hetero world that we were born into. Hello, friends and fellow travelers. I'm Tyler. And I'm Sheldon. Welcome to Lavender Lingo. Today is all about LGBT safe spaces, what they are, their history, and our experience with them. These spaces are so crucial to our identities. They allow us to express ourselves, and unfortunately, since the pandemic, there's been a major decline in authentic queer spaces. And that makes us wonder, is that because they're no longer necessary or because they're no longer important to our community? So I guess I'll start by asking, what is a queer space? A queer space, most simply defined, is a space used and or appropriated by homosexuals or gender non-conforming individuals. And in reality, they're even so much more than that. They're places that allow us to find safety and refuge places for us to find sexual liberation or create a community, and give us freedom of expression that allow us to figure out who we are as individuals. These are places that allow us to be our true, authentic, queer selves and to find others like us. Some examples of these include LGBT community centers, gay bars and clubs, ballroom events, bathhouses, but also places like bookshops, ice cream parlors, motels, cruises, restaurants, and even whole towns or districts within larger cities, and so much more. So Tyler, what about the history of queer spaces? As long as there have been queer people, there have also been queer spaces. Things that we don't typically connotate as queer, like a pirate ship or the Roman baths, were arguably some of the first queer spaces. It's from places like these that weren't explicitly queer, but facilitated the engagement of queer individuals that queer spaces were probably born. An example of this would be the bathhouses and how they were used in Renaissance Florence. Now that would be after the Catholic religion spread and the Catholic church ruled over Italy. These officially became places where men could meet other men. This was so prevalent that the city's criminal court started doing raids of the bathhouses, which resulted in the arrest of 44 different men over the course of two years. Actually, we're going to be talking about the gayness of the Renaissance era in our next video. So make sure you hit subscribe if you're interested in sticking along and listening to that. <laughs> because LGBT relations were still seen as immoral, in the 17th century, underground gay bars and LGBT bars started popping up all over that specifically catered to the LGBT and queer communities. The Zanzibar in Cannes, France was arguably the first gay bar in the modern sense of the term. It opened in 1885 and existed for 125 years before it closed in 2010. But then by the 20th century, these establishments began to pop up all over the Americas and Europe. Although highly contested about the time it started, it seems that modern barroom culture, a place highly dedicated to queer people of color, can be traced back to the interracial drag balls of New York City and Baltimore that started in the late 1890s. These balls were safe spaces for queer people, and they really showed how numerous we as a community are, because we have safety in numbers. The modern concept of a safe space originated in 1989 by the gay and lesbian urban explorers when they designed this symbol. As part of an anti-homophobia workshop in an attempt to provide individuals or institutions with a way to designate themselves as an LGBT ally or safe space. And now I guess we could talk about our experiences in queer spaces. Before we get to our list, let us know in the comments what your favorite LGBT LGBT spaces are. We're making it our mission to visit them as we travel across the US and the world. The truth is, is that before moving to New York, we did not have a lot of experience with queer or LGBT spaces. My first experience with an LGBT safe space was probably while I was attending Metropolitan State University of Denver, getting my first degree. During my off hours, I would go to the LGBT community center or safe center, student center, student center that they had there. And I would specifically describe this place as a queer oriented space. And we would go in there and play play games or read books or take naps or just hang out and talk to people. But most importantly, this was a space where I could go and meet other LGBT individuals on campus. I think my first queer experience actually was with Tyler. <laughs> uh, we went to a gay club in Denver called Trax on like two separate occasions. I don't remember if it was the first or second time, but I had like a big dance battle and I was like twerking down in the back, which was probably embarrassing, but there's no videos that exist, or at least any that I know of, so. <laughs> so lucky Tyler. Overall, it was a really good experience. We ended up meeting with Trace Royale at Trax. Um, we had a really good time. It was a really welcoming environment, so. Another time we actually got kicked out of there because. That's a long story, bro. No, we'll tell him because somebody kept pushing into us and then somebody else 
went flying off the stage at them. No, that wasn't you. That was not me and that's not what happened, yeah. no. What happened is we lost a friend and we're trying to cut through the crowd and but we bumped into some guy, not even hard, like just going through the crowd and he was like out or something and like choke slamming into a wall and our friend ended up, they had this Flew like dance. Flew off the stage. It was like a go-go stage that they had in the club. She literally like ran and jumped on this dude's back and we all ended up in kicked out. So. Like overall, positive experience. Uh, we also went to Pride in Denver on two different occasions. Uh, no, once... one occasion. This was like right when we first came out because we went with my sister and right. my sister's friend and we got little fake tattoos that had our each other's name on our collarbones. Actually, while we were there, Sheldon got his ear sucked by some oh, yeah, guy. Yeah, that was weird. I think we left after that. Yeah, we left <laughs> immediately after that. I think just being in that experience for the first time, you're introduced into a whole new type of like freedom of expression and we were also really young. It wasn't until we decided to move to New York when we really started to experience gay spaces and LGBT safe spaces. I think our first experience was actually when we came out here looking for an apartment and we walked into the village and the village is just essentially the gayborhood of New York City. You could walk around the village and you were literally surrounded on all sides by a billion other LGBT people. There's so many gay bars and gay clubs. There's so many gay experiences and gay shops, gay sex shops, gay everything. Everything is queer oriented. And it is the first time I think that we've ever been in a place where everywhere you look is LGBT. And everything is so normalized too. Yeah. After moving here to New York City, we definitely had a lot more queer experiences. Uh, first, I would name Jacob Reese Beach. Personally, I love going to the beach. And in the summer, we spend a good amount of time at the beach because I insist on going there. And it was super cool the first time that we ever went to Reese Beach, seeing that there was a whole side of the beach that is designated as queer. And it's just a bunch of different LGBT people living their best lives, hanging out with each other, enjoying the summer, enjoying the beach, Half and naked. just being, yeah, <laughs> or even naked because uh, up until very recently that was a nude beach or like nudity was a lot at that beach and if there's one thing about New Yorkers is that they don't follow a rule. So people still go nude at that beach all the time, but it's just such a freeing environment and it's so fun and I really enjoy it. Another really cool LGBT experience that we've had here in the city is all of the different nightclubs and bars that we've gotten to go to that are queer specific. Um, no LGBT specific because like places like Industry or places like Three Dollar Bill, those are two gay clubs that we've been to that we had a phenomenal time. We've been to Industry mostly to see drag shows, mm -hmm. but we've also been there like on Halloween, which we saw a drag show as well. <laughs> Another House of Yes, which this one House of Yes was amazing. Yeah, this one I would define as a queer space. You had the entire spectrum of LGBTQIA plus at this bar. Well, super. Super welcoming environment, super caring environment. Also, like not just the people that are there, but the staff, but also just like undeniably unashamed, like super, super queer environment. And it's it's really awesome being there. Another really big one that we experienced in the city was the Eagle, which was <laughs> our first sex positive gay club in New York City. It was an experience where, you know, they have the dark rooms where people are um, canoodling all around <laughs> the entire bar. And Lots club. of nudity everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. This space is specifically for gay men. There are not really any other individuals in there. I mean, we did bring our straight friend, but I did have to ask. A cis hetero friend. Uh, yeah, a cis hetero female friend. We were like, is it okay if we take her in? She was completely oblivious to what was happening anyway, <laughs> but. Um, we had a good time though. Yeah, it was, it was a good time. And finally, we couldn't talk about queer New York City without mentioning Pride because New York City Pride is probably the most gay, biggest, bold celebration of queerness that we either of us have ever been to, and it's so much fun. Everybody, the whole city dresses up, gets on theme, everybody goes out to the parade, which was the first Pride Parade that we'd ever seen because we missed the one in Denver, mm -hmm. and then goes from the parade and goes to Washington Square Park, and there's just a massive party, and everybody gets crazy, and it's such a good time, and such just like a, a liberating, celebration of like freedom and self-expression and queerness and so it's it was it's just overwhelmingly cool and it makes me super excited to go to places like Toronto or like Brazil or all, all these other places yeah where they have like these amazing pride parades and abroad we experienced Provincetown which abroad oh, you're right not in New York City um, in our travels we came across Provincetown and that was probably the single queerest town I've ever been in specifically gay it's like the gayest yeah place in America, mm -hmm. which is cool. It's so cute. They have like all of the Cape Cod shiplap style houses and everything's super nice. And there's super cute restaurants and it's right on the beach. The beach is beautiful. The whole Cape is beautiful, honestly. 
And it's cool to see somewhere where everything is just gay oriented. There's drag shows, like all the shops are gay, the, there's flags everywhere, there's gay couples everywhere. You know, the majority of the population is LGBT, so it's just cool to see a safe haven like that. Everybody just talked to us like, I don't know, like we were the norm. And that just doesn't happen everywhere you go. Finally on our list of gay experiences would this be one Costa abroad. Rica. <laughs> this one was in fact abroad. Um, it was our first like sort of LGBT experience abroad really. So we ended up going to this place called Club Hispalis, which is a gay bathhouse in Costa Rica. Our first one. Our first one. Um, and we had previously discussed like ground rules for everything and like made sure that we were comfortable with everything and whatnot, which is super important. But we ended up going and it was a really unique, fun experience. Um, very different for us. Yeah, definitely very different from us. But again, overwhelmingly positive. I think we had a lot of fun and it was a lot of fun like getting to explore like a different side of our community. Yeah. We went to a gay bar other than that and in that gay bar like if you were here in New York City for example the men would be dressed in or provocatively provocatively when we went to the uh, gay bar in Costa Rica it was very much like button-ups and dress shoes and, and jeans and, jeans, yeah, and no was, one was dancing really that being said it did turn into a party so we have to you can't say nobody was dancing it did it did turn out I think that we was because of, fun, of us but... because we were <laughs> dancing in the middle like making a whole scene everybody was staring at us I mean I'm sure they did it I don't know, but it was it was really amazing to see. It was amazing to see how they express themselves. In a later video, we are going to talk about how different cultures express themselves around the world for LGBT people because yeah. that is such an interesting concept. And a good something to take a look at. Yeah. So, what makes queer spaces so important? I personally used to think that queer spaces were kind of overrated. I thought that society had just advanced enough to a point where me as an LGBT person, I could just go out in society and exist and be recognized as being normal and a part of everything. And while that does ring true to some regard, there is a certain level of love and acceptance and understanding that you find in a queer space that you're just not going to get anywhere else. Because the reality is that things are different for us. And while we are normal and a part of everyday society and it becoming more and more accepted, there's those nuances that you only get by interacting with somebody in your community, somebody who understands exactly where you're coming from and that's what you find in a queer space and that's why I think they're so crucial. To be honest, I actually completely agree with Sheldon. Living in Colorado, I kind of thought the exact same thing at the beginning, like queer spaces weren't that necessary, but it wasn't really until I moved here to New York where I realized how important those queer spaces are. And honestly, now I prefer being in a queer space because I just feel so much more accepted to be myself. I'm able to explore my identity and explore my relationship and explore how I want to present myself without fear of judgment. Looking forward when, as we look for a house, because that is our next goal in life, but as we do that, it is just kind of realizing that we want to find a place where we can find a queer community or an LGBT community that we exist in and we're allowed to be ourselves freely in that is similar to what we found here in New York because unfortunately, I don't think we found that yet in all of our travels across the United yeah. States and we have seen a lot of it. So, I mean. Maybe it's time to leave the US. <laughs> <laughs> By America. The reality is that queer spaces have provided us with shelter in the past, allowing us to congregate and giving us shelter from the harshness of society. They allow us to embrace our individuality and build community with one another, weaving together a culture as unique and resilient as our own. And that's why now it's more important than ever to go out and find a queer community that you fit into. Find those LGBT spaces that fit you as an individual. Next time on Lavender Lingo, we're gonna be talking about the Renaissance. And how unequivocally gay it was. <laughs> we'll discuss the homoeroticism of Renaissance art. Uncover the dirty little secrets of some of the most brilliant brilliant figures of the Renaissance. And highlight how queer influence steered one of the most revered times in history. Wow. Until then, make good choices. And stay safe out there, besties. Bye. Bye.